Hey minions, welcome to Crank It Up. I'm Jim Price, and this video is a prerequisite for understanding what I hope is the next series. Nothing is guaranteed, but if all goes according to plan, the next series will be super interesting, something very unusual, very hard to make, and will offer a new perspective for hardcore fans who care about seeing behind the curtain. But this week, I am talking about the different ways to change a smash-up card and how the game used these historically. Factions are never exactly what they start as. They change, they evolve, and they balance. But how exactly does that happen? What type of changes are available? That's what this video will cover today, and for each type of change, I will include specific examples of how Smash Up has used them in the past so that you can see them in action. The core of this problem is a fundamental question that needs to be asked. Is the card basically right? I typically describe this in terms of two concepts, form and function. Form asks, is the shape of the card right? Is this a minion or an action? If it is a minion, does it feel like the right rank? If it's an action, is it the right type? Function asks, is this card trying to do the right thing? Is it adding power in the faction needs power? Is it solving the right problem for the faction? If these two questions return yes, then the card is basically correct, and it falls into balance changes. If not, the card goes in a different direction. Let's start with the most obvious cases. Form and function is correct, so now we ask, is the card too strong or too weak? If it is too weak, you make it better, often called a buff. If it is too strong, you make it weaker, often called a nerf. Every faction goes through these changes, even if all cards are conceptually what they are supposed to be. There are going to be balance changes. The question is, how large are these actual changes? Sometimes these changes are extremely small, which I call a micro buff or micro nerf. For example, Captain America used to be able to grant power to himself as well. The final version goes to each other minion. In that context, in the grand scheme of things, I consider one power to be a micro nerf. Spectrum, on the other hand, used to have Ram's ability to move to another base and return a minion there of power to a less. Clearly that ability was lost, and that's a full blown nerf rather than a micro nerf. Sometimes nerfs can be massive. In the case of All for One, after you played an action affecting that minion, you got to play an extra action. As you can imagine, this was insane. Just imagine Cyberback being played and promptly playing every modifier from your discard pile to instantly double score. But did you know that it's possible to buff and nerf at the same time? I call that smoothing. Inevitably, it will feel like smoothing ends up pushing in one direction or the other, but that's never the core intention. The idea is to make the ability more creative or flexible. An example of this is Green Goblin. Green Goblin used to be a 4 who reduced by 2, but it became a 3 who reduced by 3. Either way, played terminally, it contributes 6 potential. Power helps you win, which is smaller, but BP reduction helps Sinister 6 more, and the activation factor is stronger. But if you go with the lower power, it's more vulnerable. Overall, I think Green Goblin plays as a net buff, especially with all the synergy benefits of being power 3, but you can see that the intention is to stretch it in both directions. You get a power nerf, but an ability buff. My favorite example of smoothing is Finnis the Falcon. Originally, Finnis could move to or from a scoring base before it scored, which was deemed too powerful, rather than being considered the payoff for transforming into an upper tier minion. So to nerf it, it was suggested that Finnis could move from the scoring base, but had to lose all of its power counters and actions first, which is about as ugly a hack as you can get. To prevent this tragedy, someone very elegantly was suggested returning to the hand and replaying it on a different base, which overall nerfs Finnis from being able to move with equity, but adds new use cases such as on-play reactions and potentially moving back in stronger form. If not done carefully though, straight buffs or nerfs can be mistaken for smoothing. An example of this fake smoothing is Red Skull, who originally had the talent to destroy one of your minions to draw two cards. Now the talent draws one card, and the ongoing draws the other. This is mostly a buff, because you can trigger the ongoing multiple times per turn, or if the first time was triggered by someone like Strucker. For this to be smoothing, you need an accompanying nerf. It does change the time in which the cards are actually in the hand, but as of now, that hasn't been all that relevant. There is a specific type of buff that I want to address, which our community calls stapling. There are hybrid abilities where a card has two or more abilities that seem linked or related. And then there is stapling, where it feels like a card had room, so it got a random buff. To me, an example of this is Guinevere. Guinevere did not originally have her protection ability, but it was decided that knights needed protection, so she got it, even though it doesn't feel like a natural part of her ability. I find that a good test with stapling is, does the ability feel like it was always there? If it feels like it was there from the beginning, then the card was likely conceived that way. 
But if that ability feels like it solved a perceived need, like protection of actions with Guinevere, it was likely stapled on later. Stapling tends to happen when a card has in its value proposition, and it feels like you could squeeze in a little more. For example, consider Sinister Six. They have two cards with stapled on abilities, Cover the Exits and Inside Panic, whose abilities were added super late. In the case of Inside Panic, there was a perceived need that Sinister Six struggled against Spider-Verse because, I mean, come on, it's one faction. At the same time, I've always found Full Moon and Sleep Spores types to be weak on their own. Plus or minus one isn't enough, so they need something else to stand out, and they do have room. It just so happens that these abilities feel like they were assigned randomly to me. I could make it a legitimate argument that these abilities would make sense to be switched, but I won't. Instead, I will point out that a card like Become Shores feels much more natural, and I would consider that a buff rather than a stable down ability, and I have no idea if it was there all along. Stapling is hard to detect because it is a matter of perspective, but I would definitely attest to feeling that when a faction doesn't have stable down abilities, it feels much more natural and elegant. All of these methods assume that a card is basically correct, but what if it's not? There are several options. When the form of a card is wrong, the first option is to reshape it. An example of this is Righteous Fury. Righteous Fury was originally a standard action for three temporary power. Its function was always power, but the form of it was wrong. As a terminal standard action, this is very cast unfriendly. Combined with their other double feature of Battle Rage, four terminal double features is very difficult to swallow, especially with a faction that plays so many extra actions. You're passing on too many of them. So Mandit suggested that this card be reshaped into a modifier since power counters were forbidden because power counters killed the op's parents. With the card taking on a new form, the faction gets another playstyle, much less bursty, with a lot more flexibility, even though you could still use it as a burst. Sometimes form is correct, but function is wrong. That's when reclassifying happens. Did you know that Avengers have as many as five different deck sifting cards at various points? Now, no faction should ever have that much sifting because you just end up sifting your sifting cards, but what is interesting is the spots that were taken up. For example, instead of aggressively sifting until you got your minion and actions aligned, modular tech let you play the actions early, knowing that you can move them later. Does this work in practice? I'm not sure, but it's definitely a different function. Another card that changed function was Rocket Boots. It also changed shape, being Iron Man's character modifier that was basically TDAC or Deck Sift. These cards took Avengers in a completely different, ultimately better direction. Sometimes a card is right, but its quantity is wrong, so cards get requantified. Using Sinister Six as an example again, Reroute the Power wasn't always a double feature, but for a faction that has lots of breakpoint reduction, they need actual power to help them win, so that card became a natural double feature target. But if one gets added, one card needs to be removed. In this case, Sinister Six lost a second copy of My Master Plan. Famously, Mandate got Proving Ground and Troop Drop to swap quantities. Issues with Troop Drop aside, this was essential for S.H.I.E.L.D. as it solved numerous cast problems for S.H.I.E.L.D. and let them use Mission Debriefing terminally. Requantifying can happen with minions as well, but there's a special case that I call a Rank Swap. Rank swaps are fascinating because the abilities are largely correct, but the distribution and role is wrong. S.H.I.E.L.D. had a famous rank swap between their Elite and Soldier. Originally, the Murray Hill ability was on the Soldier and the extra play on the Elite, and it was three or less. But the drop-off between Nick Fury and Maria Hill was extremely steep and noticeable, and it made them incredibly strong with Swarm since it was easy to get the Soldiers to be extremely powerful. So the abilities were swapped. Marvel had another rank swap with Kree between their Soldier and the Elite. Originally, the soldiers drew a card while the elites played an action, and those abilities were obviously swapped. As a consequence, Minerva got to draw two cards, which I think is excessive, but the swap meant that they were more consistent with being able to play their actions. I actually think rank swap should be considered more often. I'd be curious what the effect on cowboys would be if Gunfighter and Pinkerton were swapped. If you're curious, minions can be requantified without a rank swap. In their middle phase, Hydra was minion starved, and players wanted more recursion. But in keeping with the mantra of more bullets, less reloads, Mandit instead suggested increasing the minion count from 10 to 12, hoping to get the Grim Reaper into Hydra. Instead, Hydra agents jumped from 4 to 6. In that feign, they function more like bodies than anything else, but it's still a requantification without actually doing a rank swap. Over the course of balancing a faction, cards can go through many of these iterations. Going back to the previous example of All for One, it was originally an Ambigan style card, Dump Your Hand for Power. This was problematic because musketeer actions don't do much on their own, so dumping their hands meant hamstringing them for a long time, 
but also because with the cards they did have, you could create a one-turn infinite first mate. So from its original form and function of standard action finisher, it was reshaped to become a minion modifier with the function of being an amplifier and the card you play first. That was quite the change over time with buffs and nurse along the way like that extra action. So those are the ways that cards can change over time. I hope that this could be a segue into a new series that had to do with specific card changes and the nature of why they changed. Which of these changes surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Let's shut it down.